Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. You ever do that thing where you're looking at the socials of an ex or an old flame or even just like an unreciprocated one-way crush from back in the day? And then your brain just starts to entertain the big questions of, oh, what if or what happened? You know, that sort of thing. That distant longing is at the core of today's book, titled Touch by Olaf Olafsson. It's about a guy, Christopher, whose long-ago lover, Miko, hits him up. See, Miko's dad just disappeared, and so, of course, they've got to figure out what happened. And that's only one of the mysteries of the book, the other being those big questions I was talking about before, the what happened of it all. And Olafson talks to NPR's Mary Louise Kelly about how when you're thinking of the past like that, it's easy to get lost in the fog of memory. In a person's life, is there always the one that got away? The person, maybe persons, about whom you wonder, what if? Well, Olaf Olafson's new novel takes that question to a new level. His protagonist, Christopher, is an Icelandic man in his 70s who has spent the last 50 years looking for and longing for a woman he loved in his 20s. The book is titled Touch. Olaf Olafson is with me now. Welcome. Thank you. Let's start at the beginning. By which I mean not where your novel starts, which is present day or or nearly. It's at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, But back where your story really starts, which is with two young people who at that time lived in London in the 1960s and they fell in love. Um, Christopher, to start, introduce us to him. Christopher is a... An Icelandic man, as you as you said, and in the sixties he is studying at the London School of Economics, um, and he decides, for complicated reasons, maybe to quit his studies, and on an impulse takes a job at a Japanese restaurant in London. And there were not many of them uh, back then. This is one of the first ones, and there he meets a woman his age, a Japanese immigrant, Miko, and they fall in love. Yeah. Their affair, their romance is short, but incredibly intense. And it sets the mood for the whole novel because there's a lot that um, you don't know about what's happening between them. There's a lot that Christopher can't figure out that it seems Miko is not telling him. Um, One thing we do know is how she describes herself. She uses a term that I was not familiar with. Um, Hibakusha, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes. Okay. What is Hibakusha? Hippokosha is a survivor of the atomic bomb. And uh, this, I heard, I heard the term first um, in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, when I traveled a lot to Japan. I spent a lot of time in Japan. And it's, uh, as we say, it's a loaded, it's a loaded word with all kinds of uh, references and the stigmas and, and uh, history, of course. Um, and being a, a hippokusha in the Japanese society um, is is um, is not easy. And uh, without giving too much away, um, that is uh, that was something Miko never talked about. And uh, so, when she disappears, she and her uh, father disappear all of a sudden, leaving Christopher not only heartbroken, of course, but with a lot of questions and. Uh, and at the beginning of the novel, which, as you as you mentioned, takes place at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, she reaches out to him uh, for the first time in 50 years. And uh, he decides to go and try to find her. It's such a compelling way to open your story with Christopher, now, now an old man. And he gets this message out of the blue on Facebook from a woman he hasn't heard from in 50 years. How did you approach writing that moment? How did you decide that's where you needed to start the story? I had been walking around with this idea in my mind for for a long time, this story. And uh, in March of 2020, my uh, wife and daughter and I, we found ourselves in uh, Reykjavik, Iceland. Um, And it dawned on me that this was the perfect setting for this story. it's not a pandemic story. It's a it's 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 Christopher's and Miko's story, but um, it takes place during the pandemic. And when I was when I was writing the book, and he decides to leave Iceland to to search for her. I mean, uh, I was hearing you know like we all were you know news reports of flights being 
canceled of of uh, countries shutting down etc 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 and and i had to i had to get him out of iceland to london first and then to japan at, at that point so this was i was writing that kind of um, in real time, if you want. Ah, well, and it gave a strange urgency to a love story yes. that had been on pause for 50 years. And it was, suddenly it was not only are we getting old, but if I'm going to ever see this woman again, I got to get on a plane right now. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. There was no, he's a widower. The, yeah, the novel talks about his, his marriage. Um, you know, the woman that after he got back to Iceland from London, and uh, and he's a widower now, and and he's just closed his restaurant because of the pandemic. And there's one thing on his mind: it's it's to see Miko and find out what actually happened. So he he makes the trip. So the book, people are obviously gathering. It's a love story. Um, it's also a mystery because we don't find out until the very end the mystery of why Miko disappeared and ended their affair. It was also, I thought, a meditation on loneliness, how it is possible to be surrounded by people, even people you love, and still feel a very specific loneliness in the absence of a very specific person. Yes, and the pandemic was, was probably the perfect time to write about that kind of loneliness and sort of the loneliness that you find yourself in if, if you feel you're, you haven't lived the life you perhaps we're hoping to live or wanted to live at some point. Is the book also perhaps a meditation on memory, on what we choose to remember? Um, and you make that more poignant because Christopher um, has been diagnosed, we don't know details, but with some form of memory loss. Yes, and that, I, I love writing first person. I love the channeling, if you if you want, mm -hmm. um, a protagonist in first person, because you you see everything through his or her eyes, and uh, and the, and the reader has to determine how much they can uh, trust the narrator and and his or her memory. And uh, and Christopher is questioning his own honesty, maybe uh, questioning his history. And the trick for me is to evolve that through the through the novel. Uh, you know, I I enjoy it very much, sort of putting myself in that in that situation and. And you know, I, I kind of teased my my friends who are who are actors and, and and say they have to do you know go into a character and do that for you know weeks. And I said, well, you know, that's what that's what you do as a novelist yeah. when you go into a character for months or years. Well, I will say it's one of the huge challenges is how you end a love story in a way that feels satisfying but not treacly. Um, and how you end a mystery in a way that feels satisfying and not totally outlandish. And without giving anything away, I thought you nailed them both. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Well, thank you um, for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. That is the writer, Olaf Olafsson. His new novel is titled Touch. Touch.